Hey there guys, it's Salus, and today I have the pleasure of announcing to the YouTuberverse Machines at War 3. I'm bad at this. Machines at War 3 is the new game from Isotope 244, whose previous games include Machines at War and Land Air Sea Warfare, which is in fact Machines at War 2, because that's not confusing at all. And as a result, this is the next instalment of the series. The game is designed with a fairly nice look to it. It kind of reminds me of the Command and Conquer series, and even despite of all the units being absolutely teeny tiny, you can, for the most part, discern the differences between them. That being said, given the way you select units, which I will get onto later, it would have been more beneficial to the player for the units to have been bigger. The terrain you fight in, for the most part, is fairly good. But there are some parts of it I'm not overly keen on, such as the pink water on some of the missions, or some of the low quality shadows from the larger terrain objects. The standard RTS UI returns in this game, but it is a bit awkwardly sized, particularly when you're playing at a higher resolution like 1080p or above. The minimap becomes very, very small and makes changing the camera location a bit fiddly, so if you're trying to target a specific location, you may have some trouble. Enemy variety is pretty much all but absent from this game because the enemy will always have exactly the same units as you do. And even though they're a different colour, when you've got a large scale battle going on, say about 50 plus units aside, it does become a bit of a clusterfuck. Clusterfuckery aside, animation quality is quite good in this game. The newly added infantry units move pretty well, and they even have a good swimming animation, which is quite funny to watch. The air units, such as the Apache, are well animated and genuinely behave like a helicopter would do. The ground units in this game kind of slide along the ground, but that's made kind of half believable because a lot of the units are in fact hovercraft, and as a result they're just as good on the ground as they are in the water. My favourite unit animations in this game come from the sea units. The boats have some really nice detail put into them. So do some of the planes, but the boats tend to spread out more while they travel, and as a result you can see it better. As well as a really nice looking wake behind the ship. The sea units are just really good in my opinion. But this game does introduce something a bit different to most RTS. Mega units. These are single-use, highly advanced, very big units. And as their name suggests, they are also very powerful. To build these, it requires specific, unique minerals. Unfortunately, these minerals can be a little bit tricky to see, especially if they're underwater. But once you've built a mega unit, it does look pretty fantastic. They look scary, they look big, and they look powerful. However, given all the detail and good looks of these, it does make me think the guys over at Isotope 244 spent more time working on these units than the others. Well, now you've heard my opinion on the design work, I guess you want to hear about the sound. Eh. That's about all I have to say for it, unfortunately. The music used throughout consists of very generic military tunes, and that's about it. The game features no voice acting at all, so all mission briefs have to be read and all updates and alerts are also a reading job. But to say it has no voice acting at all would be kind of half a lie. All of the warnings that you get when you say need more minerals or need more power are voiced, but if it isn't a digitised voice, it does sound very much like someone doing a good impression of one. The sound effects used throughout are also quite generic. There are certain exceptions, engine sounds are pretty well done, and I particularly like the sounds from the helicopter's rotors, but the rest are incredibly generic. The weapons sound kind of cartoonish and unbelievable. The guns sound very weak, and the missiles sound more like a light breeze rushing through an alley, even the torpedoes, which are probably one of the best weapon sounds, don't sound that impressive. So for me, sound isn't the overall winner. This time, I'm going to look at the gameplay a little differently. 
as you know, I normally judge a game when I'm reviewing it exclusively on the single player campaign. But in the case of Machines at War 3, a campaign is entirely new ground for the series. The previous two games did not have a campaign, or for that matter any infantry units at all. So allow me to start with the campaign and then I'll look at how this game handles when it's in its wheelhouse. The campaign gameplay is very slow, but it's also fairly varied. For example, there are missions where you have to hit specific targets, somewhere you need to take command of specific buildings or specific units, and there are some escort missions. But it's your standard build a base and use it to create an army. But unlike some other games in the genre, you can very quickly and very cheaply mass produce units. And when you've got a choice of over 130 units in this game, you won't be stuck for choice. Granted, there are some units you won't use very often, such as wasps were one of the ones I found I rarely used. But that's kind of to be expected with an army variety this large. You also have access to some long-range cannons. So, when you send out your force, you can use these cannons to cover your units from afar. But as I have said, there are some things in this campaign such as creating buildings or moving across a very large map, which take a long time. Thankfully, they did add a fast forward button, which increases the game speed up to five times faster and then also provides you the option to decrease it to 0.5 of normal. Unfortunately, if you leave this on too long, it also causes some moments where you become overwhelmed due to some of the issues with the controls, but I'll get on to that later. But where this game really, really works well is in its newly added online multiplayer and its skirmish mode. These are continued from earlier in the series and they allow you to create your own battles based on whatever rules you want. For example, I tried out a deathmatch skirmish using naval units only on a map with very limited water, creating some intense battles in these limited like choke points. Things like this are where the game really shines. But that might just be because I'm one of those gamers who likes the idea of creating house rules to generally screw around with my friends while having a beer and laughing my ass off. But this is where Machines at War is strongest. Now that they've added online multiplayer and infantry units, I really want to try out a game on an island's map. Infantry units only, so they have to swim for it. And it would be genuinely fun to do. Regardless of the limits of the campaign, there is plenty in this game to keep you entertained. But if you like the, com the classic Command and Conquer games and don't mind slower and very long missions, then the campaign might be for you as well. Plus, the campaign does give you the option of launching an ICBM as a finishing blow, which is always kind of cool. Okay, story spoilers incoming. Deal with it. You play a US commander who gets sent out to recover a science team who were working on a secret project. A new piece of technology to be specific. But they've gone missing for some reason. And a Chinese general has become rather aggressive in recent times. And the only thing that you found at the site of the science team was a text message. Because apparently that's the most covert method of communicating with a military force. And this text message read, we were forced to do it. Thus, this leads you and your army on a mystery-solving tour of the world in search of the science team, and a desperate attempt to save the team and recover the research, all while trying to stop the enemy from building mega-weapons. Now, while this story is rather shallow and traditional, it is well executed and pretty well weaved into the game. It even introduces some fun and interesting characters, my personal favourite being Samantha Vice, who has some genuinely witty lines. Especially when you pick up the first Mega Unit. The only problem I have with the game's story is the fashionably late syndrome it suffers from. For a large portion of the story, the science team you are tracking is being moved from base to base. And conveniently, they're always moved right at the minute you show up. And it means you're only able to salvage the leftover research which they dropped in their hurry to be moved on before a resolution could arrive. But other than that, 
the story is pretty well conceived. And you do get immersed into it after a couple of hours. The controls for this game are the biggest issue I have with it, however. The game is entirely mouse driven, using only one of the six buttons available to me, and almost no keyboard controls at all. There are no keyboard shortcuts to select what to do, which results in constant back and forth clicking with the mouse to position buildings and move units, and this really slows things down. Especially now they've introduced online multiplayer, because the kind of people who enjoy online RTS are normally those who want to keep their actions per minute really high so they can ruffle stomp their opponents in a matter of minutes and claim an early victory. But another bugbear of the controls is how you handle units. You can't, for instance, separate them into two quick swappable forces to create a pincer movement, and this is a result of having no keyboard shortcuts. Instead, you get the choice of one of four options. Select one unit, select all units of that type, as long as they're on the screen, select all the units that you can drag the selectomatic box over, or select every unit on the face of the planet who's still saluting the stars and stripes. This method of selection doesn't work too well with some of the smaller units, like the Wasp Fighters, for example, because they have a very erratic flight pattern, and thanks to the UI scaling, they are actually smaller than the infantry units, which does make me wonder how the pilot fits in. And when you do get your units selected, they seem to interpret the commands you give them more as vague suggestions rather than actual orders, on several occasions I found all of my army shooting at the walls whilst I begged them to walk over and attack the big ass cannon not an inch away. For a real time strategy game, there seems to be very little strategy beyond build lots of things and go attack a few things. Come to think of it, with the speed up time button there isn't much real time either. The game, however, is rather well optimised. I get some very smooth frame rates on both my usual testing devices, that's my massive gaming rig and my kind of mid-range consumer laptop. And I can even turn the graphics up higher than I expected on the laptop, so that's a plus. Even when I have almost 100 units on the screen at once, it doesn't even think of chugging like other games would. So I would argue this would be a safe bet for any of you watching this review. Replay value in this game comes from the skirmish mode and the online multiplayer primarily. However, it does offer you the chance to go back through the campaign and select the missions you want to take care of to get all the bonus objectives you may have missed. Because, I don't know, for example, you were focusing on not getting your base destroyed the first time. But, as I said earlier in this review, the skirmish mode and online play is where the game truly shines. The ability to create custom games with almost any rules you want and enjoy them with friends, or indeed total randoms who share your idea of fun. It transforms the game from a traditional military RTS into a hilarious frat boy trolling engine. So, to conclude, this is a game that would probably appeal to the kind of gamer who firstly has friends, and wants to enjoy some cool house rules gameplay. It would also scratch the itch of people who like lengthy battles where you have to counter almost every unit in the game could possibly throw at you, and the kind of person who can handle the micromanagement of absolutely everything at once. So, is it worth your time? Yes, with an asterisk. The game is currently on Steam Greenlight, so I would recommend supporting this title because all of the problems I have with this game can easily be patched out post-release. But in the meantime, if you're willing to, you can play it in a lower resolution and it will fix the UI scaling somewhat. And granted the other problems might need some patching, but it can be really fun once all this is sorted. Unfortunately, as a result of this, the game ends up getting the ever unpopular statement, could be better, could be worse. And as a result of that, I think it needs two scores. The first score I'm going to give it is... In its current state, how does it handle? So, if the game was released in its current state, it would get 4 out of 10. 
if it was patched and it fixed all the issues I have, I'd still be tempted to give it a 6 out of 10. So, thanks for watching my review of Machines at War 3. Remember to like and share this video. Until next week, I've been Salas. Go support this game on green light. Link in the description below. And I will see you next time.